This is Laura Backus from writingblueprints.com, and we are pleased to present a conversation about writing, passion, and remembering what it's like to be a teenager with Alice Kuypers and Biff Naked. Alice Kuypers is an award-winning author of the new young adult novel, Me and Me, just out from HarperCollins Canada. And she's also the instructor for the upcoming middle grade young adult blueprint from writingblueprints.com. Biff Naked is a Canadian rock star, performance artist, painter, poet, activist, and author of her memoir, I Biffacus, which has just been released in paperback from HarperCollins, Canada. Both books are available online and through the author's websites, as well as in bookstores near you. And if you would like more information about Alice Kuyper's upcoming middle grade young adult blueprint writing course from Writing Blueprints, please go to the link on your screen and give us your email and we will keep you updated as to when the course is going to be released in the early fall of 2017. And now here are Alice and Biff. So what inspired you to take on the writing of a memoir? Well, to be honest with you, I, I was kind of badgered into it in a way. Um, you know, I think that I, uh, most of us uh, who are, you know, in the performing arts or who are creative people, a lot of us probably journaled or, you know, with lyric writing, I, I think that I've written 200,000 lyrics that were lousy that never got used and then the ones that get used it keeps you writing so it's a it's a muscle definitely that is an easy one to flex but lyric writing is so for me is very flowery and very exaggerated and over dramatic and i had no interest at all in writing a memoir certainly not my story um i didn't know how to do that i didn't know how to write that way and uh, it was my manager of 27 years, Peter, who basically just really pestered me and w kept after me until we started the process. And then I just basically had to force myself to sit still and, uh, and try and revisit a lot of those memories. It's um, interesting to me that you say you write 200,000 versions of your lyrics. I'm just thinking when I'm writing, it's normal for me to have to write loads of drafts, loads and loads and loads of drafts. Mm -hmm. But I had never considered that you might have to do that too. It seems like when somebody else does it, it's like, oh yeah, that's just a song, a beautiful uh, song, uh, song, piece of cake. So right. I don't know that would be part of how it goes for you. Even though that's what love does in Me and Me, she has to write her lyrics over I don't know oh why. yeah Re revisit them and refine and refine there's always a better way to say things and and self-editing in in lyric writing is uh it's kind of easy in a way editing a draft is obviously you know best left to the professionals mm -hmm. uh, but it was really like making a record whereas you can record 25 songs uh, that you think are all masterpieces and the record company only wants 10 on your record. So basically you have to um, be very flexible emotionally and not uh, take it personally if, if something is rejected. And the producer for that record and that record company makes those decisions. So because of my 20 years in the record business, I think it really prepared me uh, to work with an editor at uh, a big fancy publishing company uh, because I also, you know, didn't really understand word count very well. I didn't know how to use it. And uh, I probably submitted an extra, I don't know, 275,000 words over what they printed. So even, and some of the stories were omitted. And a lot of it was just really trimmed and refined. And I mean, I didn't even know how to use italics. I'd never used Word before. So I hand wrote everything. And I kind of assumed that that would be okay. But it was probably <laughs> three years in editing. You know, they're saints over there. They really are. So Laura's a big fan of handwriting. She really likes it when people write. Oh, good. First of all, she, she kind of encourages that because she mm. feels like 
to connect with the material. Was it difficult facing some of that material again on the page? Um, I think some of it was mostly um, I really wanted, I was very desperate to get stories about my parents out there in the world. So starting chronologically was really quite easy. Um, I, someone had told me once that it would be easier to write a memoir or write your own story as a fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, because then the most preposterous things uh, won't necessarily be upsetting for you to have out there in the world. And, and also perhaps for other people to read them and think that they couldn't possibly be true. If it was, you know, spun as a fiction, it might be uh, easier <laughs> to accept. But um, I don't know, I, I really loved, I loved the process of it. Um, I, I think that writing stories and, and storytelling uh, is probably one of the greatest gifts that a brain can have in this world. And, uh, and I mean, your book is an example of that. I mean, people, we are able to escape into, into stories that are woven around our, our minds. And it, it was, uh, you know, it's much better than television or movies, for sure. You talk a little bit about fiction there. Do you ever think about writing fiction? It was one of my questions, whether you'd ever considered writing for teenagers. You have so much in your book, although it's a very adult, mature book, um, with mature content. Like, you, you explore what it's like to be a teenager so vividly. Like, it's great for people to understand what being a teenager really means I think like that and you seem to remember that so vividly um, I think that and uh, maybe it's true for you I don't know I think that it's easy to um, kind of uh, I guess reconnect with our teenager brain in a way there's a lot of you know people uh, talk about teenagers as being kind of angst ridden or confusing time in our lives but really, it, it's not really, it's a most wonderful time where we, we're discovering freedom, we're really exploring different things in life, we're exploring different things we might want to take in, in school, we're, we're exploring different things in the world, different ideas, ideologies, and it's a real time of growth. I don't know uh, if there's another time in our lives, maybe for adults who are seeking to grow, uh, but for most people, I think that they're, um, most uh, most profound transformation probably happens during those years, and, and we really are. We form our opinions, our personalities are developing. Uh, I think that that is something that's easy for people to recall. You know, just for example, the inner child that we're told to rediscover during yoga class or or anything, or even in therapy. Um, and it's not really a child. I don't think it's fair. I think it's more like an inner teenager for most people. Yeah, people, people ask me that a lot. You know, why do you write for teenagers? And I always feel like it should be clear, you know, like, this is my answer, tick the box. But it's exactly that, that connection with, I feel like I was braver when I was a teenager and I was more open to stuff. And I was, I didn't worry about things in the same way. I just was like, yeah, sure, I'll do this crazy thing. Right. <laughs> about it you know like and you are such a brave teenager and you do so many extraordinary things and survive so many extraordinary things and terrible things and so it's just a really moving example of what writing can can do I think in your memoir I don't know it's hard not to read it and feel like <laughs> even though we've never met right like I just feel like that so you must have people who really feel like they know you now like because of how you've kind of shared yourself on the page? Oh, well, I think that originally it seemed like the, the music fans would probably be the ones that were buying the book. And so a lot of music fans that were already familiar with uh, kind of my confessional lyric style, uh, I think a lot of them probably weren't that surprised uh, with some of the more sensitive topics. But... I don't know. I think that um, a lot of uh, my peers, my age group of girls uh, in our forties, had really similar experiences in uh, in rural Canada, growing up and coming of age. Uh, the different things that affected us certainly is so different now. 
you know, I'm very relieved that I grew up in an era where there was no internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't imagine how, uh, how different life would be. When I read a lot of stuff by people who are starting out as writers, I notice they don't think about the sound of their voice on the page. They don't think about musicality and language. Does that flow naturally for you because you're a songwriter or did that take a lot of work to craft in the memoir? Well, I mean, because I've never tried to write a book or anything, even I haven't even tried to write a short story or anything before. I, I read a little bit. Um, uh, I read, I mean, I'm an avid reader, but I read a little bit that was from people who were recommending a uh, different technique for memoir writing, really specific stuff. Um, I didn't find a lot of it that helpful, except everyone seemed to always come back to saying, write how you talk. You know, mm -hmm. when you tell a story, write how you talk. And I, I just kind of held on to that, even though, um, uh, I tended to repeat things a little bit. Again, I have to credit Jim, uh, my editor, who was uh, just really gentle um, uh, about everything. It's like telling a singer that she's flat here or sharp there. I mean, you know, and being able to rein in my, my language and, uh, and kind of find a common thread in, in the... Uh, in the storytelling, it was a, it was really interesting. I, I loved it immeasurably. When I get an editorial letter, it's often like, "This is amazing! I love it so much." Just a couple of tiny things, and then you're like, <laughs> "Heavy pages." <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh God, here we go. Right, let's start. So then, what I do is I'm like, "Okay, this big picture thing is a problem." So let's say I need to look at. So with Alec in Me and Me, he's 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 more domineering than yes. When he first appears well in earlier drafts he was too domineering too early ah. well then it was like too domineering too late like it was too surprising so you know how do i get that balance how do i make him desirable not a jerk right not too aggressive but also so that he's starting to be controlling so that readers aren't totally taken aback when he becomes more controlling so then if i'm editing that i'm looking through and i'm like okay which is the point and then it starts to be like i don't even know anymore i have to send it back and ask for more help and more questions but i do tons and tons and tons of editing like it's i think 90 percent of the writing process for me seems to be in the editorial and i would love mm -hmm. to find it. like i have that natural sit down just write for the joy of it for me mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of it has to be redone afterwards and refined and fine so i think that's really interesting especially having read it and having been very charmed and seduced by him in the beginning where you know she's kind of she's a little impolite you know as a singer especially mm -hmm. reading that and reading about the uh, i had to laugh because i felt like i could really identify um as a young songwriter and you know, but for us, of course, it was scraps of napkin paper and all, all manner of things like that. But how, how impolite she was, you know, and doing lyrics in front of him and kind of like not being able to have a conversation because she was enmeshed in her lyrics. That was really funny to me. And then, yeah, it did evolve where he was. He became a little bit uh, aggressive for sure. And I... I really love the parkour that they did. I, I just thought that was a really surprising and interesting thing to read in there. How did you get interested in parkour? So we, um, so we have four little kids here, me and, me and my partner. He's a writer too. And um, then we had an older daughter, a young woman who, who isn't our blood daughter, but who lived with us for a long time and became mm -hmm. like a daughter to us. And she got really into parkour. Wow. So talk about this stuff that she was doing so eventually I said honey can I come and like watch you so she was very nice and let me come with her oh cool cool parkour friends who were all like you know 19 and 20 and like right an old lady friend there she's That's like so oh, funny and they're so agile oh my god so then they're like well you should try come come try yeah just scrape up the wall mm -hmm. and they're like this is a flip and this is, and I was like, no, I, I can't do that. But she was, she was really into it. And actually then we went over to see her in Vancouver and where she went to do some studying. 
and they had a parkour gym there. Like it's yes, they do. Yeah, no, I was really uh, impressed with uh, with how that part of the story came into it. It was just really cool. It was well, really like cool. me, this nice, you know, you saying that you felt that the singer songwriting aspect of her connected with you because I was pretty nervous when I knew you were going to be. Oh, it was so, oh my gosh, it was bang on the dynamic between her and her band. And I mean, it's just, yeah, it was perfect. It was bang on, very accurate. You know, like, well, you know, you're in your party and you say to someone, what music are you into? And the person looks totally panicked. That's me, right? Like I'm not cool when it comes to music and I'm always really out of my depth. So I was like, look, honey, do you have to be so into music? Cause I don't know anything about this. And I had to just do research and kind of root myself in in that world so I listened to tons of stuff I listened to you I listened to tons of other great like singer songwriters to try and understand it read books ask people questions same with the parkour stuff but it was wow. nerve-wracking I didn't want to get it wrong right and then when I heard you were mm-hmm. gonna read it I was like oh well if I've got it wrong I'm gonna find out pretty quick <laughs> oh no it was really cool oh, thank you so I uh when I was reading your your memoir and you talk about the song Chote, Chote, Chote. Mm-hmm. I read it and I listened to it like millions of times after that. Yeah, I have this weird wow. habit of playing the same song over and over. So Jan was like, I do the same song. thing. And we change it now. <laughs> we play it all the time. But what I like is how real life inspires your songwriting. Can you talk mm-hmm. about that process? I don't know. I think that sometimes it's, um, it's very literal and sometimes it's really metaphoric. Uh, I don't know that um, uh, I don't know that I'm anything more than a bit of an embellisher. A lot of the time, I do embellish. I love to embellish, but it's hard because basically we're trying to find uh, a different way to say I'm in love or I'm brokenhearted, mm-hmm. and that's it. <laughs> basically, that's the the root of every song. I'm convinced, and uh, and to try and find a different way to say that every single time is uh is challenging and uh you know there's songs about emancipation that seem like they're actually about tango shoes or there's songs about um you know uh trying to uh fake it till you make it and put a smile on no matter what and it's kind of spun as saying uh, i love myself today is an affirmation so uh, in a way it's kind of uh, a really fun um challenge to have to write songs because you're basically you know making it up as you go at the end of chapter 26 you talk about anxiety as a chattering monkey sitting on your shoulder um how do you manage to be so successful and so brave i guess with your songwriting and your memoir writing and sharing all that when you're dealing with anxiety and fear that that you're not good enough I think everybody has that. I mean, I think no matter what job we have, we're going to have anxiety, um, partly because we have to live in the world. And, uh, and the world is, uh, can be very cruel. It can be very, um, I guess, uh, we fear judgment. And I think that's something that's happened over the ages, hundreds, thousands of years. Everybody has feared being judged, you know, which is why we have all these amazing, crazy religions. And, uh, and they really guide us to our moral judgment so that we can avoid being judged. And anxiety for me as a female and then as an artist, um, you know, I think that it's, a, it's like having two horns on a bull. You know, it, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword in many ways. And um, I basically lie. <laughs> I think that's the key to anxiety for all of us. I mean, you know, when people ask us in the, in the grocery store or wherever we are, how are you, how are, you, how are things going, always our response is always going to be, it's great, great, things are great, great, fine, how are you? I mean, it's a greeting, not a question. So I think that we kind of grew up, whether or not our mothers answered that way, mine certainly did, she's from Minnesota, so we grew up knowing this is how we are supposed to be responding. This is how we're supposed to react. So anything that feels less than that is going to make us feel self-conscious, or me anyway. I feel self-conscious most of the time, almost all of the time. I didn't actually um, 
you know, wear makeup or pluck my eyebrows or anything until I was about 26 years old. Prior to that, I had no self-consciousness at all. And I should have, believe me, believe me, I should have. Um, and then it seemed like after that, things started changing and just the general pressure uh, that was very different from high school. High school, there's lots of pressure, sure. Um, you know, to if you're too curvy, if you're skinny, what, you know, all those uh, shallow pressures, they call them, like appearance pressures. I also had terrible acne from grade eight onward. It was terrible. So I overcompensated for that basically by being the class clown, and which was great, actually, because it led into going into theater and, uh, and going into, you know, group classes like that, like choir and theater, and uh, enabled me to pursue the job I have today. Um, but anxiety is still the same. It never leaves you. You just develop different coping techniques and, and different tools to kind of minimize it for yourself or to yeah. hide it from the world. And usually joking around tends to do that. A sense of humor always seems to diffuse everything. See, for me, um, like I have quite a panic sort of from like 16 to maybe my mid-20s. And for me, I think it was writing that helped me calm down. Like it made me feel, it makes me feel calmer. So some of the ideas in me and me I started having when I was 18. And I think it came from this idea of me being like this little version of myself. Could I be like a, you know, fun, vibrant, less stressed out version? Do I have to deal with these terrible panic attacks? I went traveling on my own when I was 18. I decided, right, I can't cope. I have panic attacks. I can't even go to the store. So I'm going to go away on my own for a year and run away from this and feel better and it, it, it isn't a way to you can't leave yourself you're still there right but while I was traveling I started writing a lot of fiction one of the ideas that I was really interested in was this idea of meeting yourself what would it be like to meet the version of you who took the other choice right like who would that be and it didn't really work as a book then. I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I'm amazed. When you say you didn't know how to write a memoir and then you produce this beautiful memoir, for me, when I decided to write a book and I was 18 and I just had no clue, it was a disaster, but I loved doing it. Wow. And the ideas of, of me and me, they came back to me when, when Lark came into my head, the character, and I wanted to look again at this notion of, who you are, like who you are when you make a different choice and how are you different and what would it be like if you met yourself, that other version of yourself, like look, this happens to her and then she's fighting with herself. And to me, that age, like you were saying at the beginning, that age of being 17 and, you know, figuring out who you are and feeling like an adult but still being a long way from necessarily being an adult, but yes. connecting with that adult version of yourself, that felt like the right time to finally write the story but all that to say writing is it's my way I guess of feeling mm -hmm. it helps me like if I haven't written for a few days I start getting edgy and grumpy and stressed and so like I wonder if songwriting does that for you oh sure and while you're talking I just think you know, it's interesting to me because I think that for what you're talking about as a writer, I'm sure that that's what painters do. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are, uh, you know, lifelong artists, the art basically, your art is your vehicle uh, for communicating all of the things, basically, mm -hmm. whether it's your, your elation in life or whether it is uh, your, your tragedies. And I think that whatever your art is, um, you know, whether it's writing or, or oil painting uh, or acrylic, much less stinky, I'm sure. Um, but anything, you know, and I think that that's probably the same uh, for songwriting, absolutely. Um, I, I think that it can be also said for chefs, people who like to chop. Chopping, I find vegetables, chopping vegetables is equally as calming. And uh, whatever somebody is passionate about uh, can be very calming. Even volunteering, you know, can calm you. You can be having, you know, the, your life is a, a complete hurricane. Uh, but by the time you pull up to, 
you know, wh wherever, whether you're volunteering at the SPCA shelter or whether you're volunteering in the hospital gift shop, you know, by the time you get to the door, all of your uh, tornado feelings are, are basically set aside and you throw yourself, you immerse yourself into this other part of your brain. And uh, it has to be the same for, for art, cooking, painting, writing, anything. I, I think that's really amazing. I think, I think too, like going back to that moment, for me, like people are asking now because the book's coming out, like, oh, it must be so exciting to see the book out. And it, it is for sure. And that's part yeah. of my mission always as a writer is to connect with readers. Yes. But also it gets in the way a little bit of the, the part that makes me feel calm, that makes me feel connected. Like yes. something for me about creating teenage worlds just fills me up, you know, like it makes me, I don't know, Locke and Alec and the whole thing, like yes. kind of, all of that just kept me going for sure. so the craziness of, of everything else that happens in the day to day. Yeah. I, uh, do you have time to read stuff? You say you mentioned reading a lot in the memoir. Do you have time to read books? Do you I find lately I have not had time to read. And uh, I used to read on the tour bus um, because I, did, I was never interested in television. I didn't have a television mm -hmm. uh, from about, I don't know, 1998 onward. I didn't have a TV because we always traveled. And I didn't have a computer until 2006. <laughs> uh, so all I did was read. And all I read, I, I think that I went through phases. I, I really uh, had, my father was a, a dentist. My parents were both academics. So all he had was medical textbooks around the house. And they were both very interested in Ayurvedic medicine, Indian medicine. Uh, so we were, all, you know, into yoga, into all these cultural uh, things that I grew up loving, but I became obsessed with writing the MCATs. I dropped out of university, believe me. I dropped out in my first year. So this is a kid with no, I didn't have a Bachelor of Science, but somehow made myself feel better in the craziness of playing 200 or 300 shows a year. All, you know, never home, always traveling. Uh, we didn't have a cell phone or anything. So I read books and I read medical textbooks. I loved it. I loved write, reading about the prefixes and suffixes of uh, the words and, and those meanings. And I had a, a bunch of different little um, paper uh, uh, books, I guess, uh, sketchbooks that I would write down these dictionaries in. And then I would write down language dictionaries. I, I met a a guy, you know, who, who spoke Polish. So I wrote every Polish word that I would need to say to him. And I wrote it phonetically, you know, and, and I just loved it. And so the stuff that I read was always like, you know, information more than anything else. I mean, and now encyclopedias are obsolete. Everyone just Googles it. It's almost a shame. Uh, and of course, much to my husband's chagrin, I kept every single book I've ever had. So these big hardcover textbooks, I mean, I used to spend hundreds of dollars on these textbooks at the medical bookstore because I just loved them. I found them fascinating. My brain totally had nothing to do with uh, showbiz in any way. And I could just focus on this like weird world of, uh, of medicine. I loved it. And, uh, it's and now it's changed. Now I started getting into fiction again. <laughs> It's, it's, <laughs> it speaks to a love of language too, that, right? Like, and, and the sound of language and the, sh like just the way words sound, which. Oh, definitely. Sense. What, um, what's next for you before we kind of start wrapping this up? Oh, we've been making a new record for the last couple of months. We just returned from Toronto where we were there in the studio and, um, I'm do I'm starting another book, uh, that's really specific about, uh, basically about how to how to be you know survive during your cancer treatments and uh, and basically you know try and throw my spin on you know how to basically enjoy life mm -hmm. uh, even though you know you know the only good thing about being bald I always say is uh, is uh, being able to throw your slayer t-shirt over your head and not have your hair get mussed up if you have feathered hair 
you know, all my little tips, my little, my little tips of the trade. I love your writing and I feel like the book will be helpful for people. I don't know. I feel like there is space for more of your words. So I'm. Wow. Coming yeah. from you. I was yeah. wow. You so cool. go through all this stuff to write these things, but yeah. it's amazing that you do all that. Um, is there anything else you wanted to ask or talk about or share? Uh, well, just I'd like to reiterate definitely how much um, your book touched me and how I could relate to it so much. Um, I, I read a lot of it to my husband aloud because uh, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, for me, I, I love reading out loud to, to, uh, to him anyway. And uh, I just thought that it was uh, really uh, very moving the way she was uh, trying to navigate really big feelings, you know, the loss of her mom and, and trying to navigate uh, her dad with a new, new person and stuff. I, I just thought it was really beautiful. Do you have, like, some of the people listening are going to be people who want to write themselves too. Like, do you have advice for people who want to who wanna write or be artistic in their lives? Well, for me, I had to escape a little bit from my life uh, just because I ha I'm a busy person and the, the schedule is always kind of random. So I couldn't, uh, I find I can't dedicate a certain time to writing because uh, something always comes up. So I had to go and stay with my parents or I had to go to France and stay with my manager and basically sequester myself seemed to work the best. Mm -hmm. uh, but just sitting down, sit down, get the butt in the chair <laughs> Put anything you can on the page, anything, yeah. and, and just you know make it a make it a daily habit if you can. Mm -hmm.